you have your copy of God's Word, let's turn together once again to Genesis chapter 1. We're going to read two passages together. Again, we've looked at one of these already, or read it in this series. We're, we're in this series on Sunday nights through the spring uh, that I've called Wonderfully Made, Learning What It Means to Be Human. Um, and I'm, I'm walking us through really seven axioms, uh, propositions that on the surface seem like they're, they're incredibly obvious to us. And yet uh, each of these really uh, represents a battleground in our culture. Uh, and so we've looked at to be human is to have a body, um, a body that's been given to us, that's wonderful and yet fragile. To be human is, is to have a soul. And, and this soul is connected together in, with our bodies in such a way that our, the whole human being uh, is, in fact, the image of God. Um, tonight, uh, it's the first of two parts. Uh, we'll, we'll pick up and pick up some other themes in a couple of weeks. But tonight, I want to talk about to be human is to be either male or female. Uh, and again, that feels obvious, and yet it's, it's not obvious, not just in our culture, but increasingly within our churches. We, we are struggling to see that being either male or female is essential to what it means to be human. But before we, we read God's word together and consider some of these ideas, let's ask God for his help. Let's pray together. Father, we do come, and we desperately need your help. Those aren't words that I say, just the transition of the prayer. Lord, we need your help to understand Holy Scripture, to reflect meaningfully upon it, to have it not just flit about in our heads, but take deep root in our hearts, to, to in the light of it, have courage to, to do what it says. Lord, we, we need your help. And so, Holy Spirit, we pray that you would come, and we pray that you would enlighten our eyes so that we might see glorious riches in this portion of your gospel. Grant us this grace, Lord, we ask. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. So two places in Genesis. First, Genesis 1, verse 26. Then God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Now Genesis 2 verse 18 then the Lord God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. Now out of the ground, the Lord God had formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all livestock and the birds of the heavens and every beast of the field but for adam there was not found a helper fit for him so the lord god caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man and while he slept took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh and the rib that the lord god had taken from the man he made into a woman and brought her to the man then the man said this at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So I, I trust you know this, but, but simply because someone is a theologian doesn't necessarily mean that they can actually read and understand the Bible. For example, a, a couple of weeks ago on Newsweek.com, uh, the president of Union Theological Seminary in New York City, uh, Serene Jones, suggested that, quote, the Bible never said that being transgender is wrong. 
This extremist, wrong-headed belief is simply based on shaky extrapolation of the text. Wow. Well, when we begin to wonder what, what biblical texts are being misused to deny the, the, the truthfulness of a transgender lifestyle, Dr. Jones tells us some claim that in Genesis, God explicitly created two biologically different genders that cannot be changed or reimagined. So that's the, the shaky extrapolation of the text that she decries. But, but don't miss that last point. Um, Dr. Jones not only warns against reading Genesis as though our, our sexed identities are essential to our, our status as created beings, but, but she also tells us what she wishes that cannot be changed or reimagined. Cannot be changed or reimagined. So, so if our, our sex identities, our, our, our biological gender, if you will, if, if she's upset that it cannot be changed or, or, or reimagined, well, then who becomes the creator? If we can change our biological gender, if we can change our sex identities, if we can reimagine them, who then becomes the creator? God, the one who, who gives us both body and soul, or human beings who reimagine and reconstruct our biology to suit our own desires. I, I mentioned this at the outset because this is the key question that, that we are facing in our culture, especially in the face of, of the transgender agenda. This question, is our God-given sex identity essential to who we are or is our sex identity and gender something that we construct? Let me say that question again, because it's really important. Is our God-given sex identity essential to who we are? Or is our sex identity and gender something that we construct? We want to suggest tonight that the Bible suggests that it's essential our, our sex identity is either male or female, is essential to our identity, not something that we construct. But behind that question is the question where, the larger question we're dealing with in this spring series on Sunday nights. What does it mean to be human? What does it mean to be body, soul people, embodied souls or, or enfleshed uh, souls or ensouled bodies? What, what does that mean? Uh, in her fabulous book, The, the Genesis of Gender, Abigail Favell suggests that there are really two uh, paradigms that are diametrically opposed to one another that are actually at war in this given cultural moment. Um, one paradigm she calls the gender paradigm. She says the gender paradigm is a godless one that tells us that we are not created beings. We are products of social forces. Reality, gender, sex, everything, even truth, is socially constructed. A denial of God leads to a denial of nature, that is, the idea of human nature. The notion that, that some aspects of human identity are pre-social and intrinsic to us. Influenced by social forces, yes, but not wholly created by them. A rejection of God in nature entails a rejection of purpose, which then leads to another consequence, the denigration of the body, because the body itself is a limit. The concrete reality of the body and sexual difference puts a limit on choice, a limit on self-improvisation, a limit on social construction. The gender paradigm then ultimately holds a negative view of embodiment. You remember Dr. Jones's quote at the beginning? She was offended at the idea that biological genders could not be changed or reimagined. That is, in fact, the gender paradigm at work. But there's another paradigm, and it's the paradigm that we read tonight. It's the Genesis paradigm. And building on what we've already seen, that, that to be human is to be body and soul, we can go further in, in order to say that, that as body-soul beings, as human beings, as, as persons, we are either male or female. And that is essential to being human. Let, let's, let's think about that through these Genesis texts. I want to just 
unpack briefly three ideas for you as we try to flesh out why is it important that we say to be human is to be either male or female. And the first idea is this. Reality exists prior to our naming. Reality exists prior to our naming. I mentioned this at the beginning because language and identity really is a key issue at this present moment. And what you see from the, the passage that we read, especially in Genesis 2, verses 18 uh, to, to about verse 21, um, is, that, is, is that Adam's naming of the animals and his naming of woman doesn't actually construct reality. It doesn't actually construct meaning. No, reality, nature, meaning, they're all present in the animals and in the woman prior to the naming of it. Uh, in fact, Genesis is, is quite explicit that uh, out of the ground the Lord God had formed every beast of the field, every bird of the heavens, and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. But the naming didn't create reality. God did. God makes. He, he makes the animals from the dust of the ground. He makes Adam from the dust. He makes the woman from Adam's rib. Adam names. And he does so in a way that corresponds to what God has already made. And so when a male baby is born with appropriate reproductive parts, the doctor isn't assigning a gender to the child. Rather, he is simply naming the reality of what is already there. The child is a boy. He is a male human. Now, now for those who view sexed identities as reimagined, as self-constructed, you can understand why naming is important. New names, new, new pronouns, um, new ways of styling oneself. They're all an effort to construct a new identity that conflicts with reality. It conflicts with what is actually there by nature, God-given. And so in order to present a new self, in order to present a new reality that's actually contradicted by the reality of the body, it's vitally important to those who are doing this, to, who are constructing this, to, to have you call them by their chosen pronoun and to have them call uh, themselves by their chosen names because the, the naming is meant to somehow replace or rework the identity is already there, but, but it, it cannot ultimately work. And the reason it can't work is because hardwired into the universe is this key idea, reality exists prior to our naming. When we name things, there's a correspondence between our naming and reality as it is given to us by God. You see, Genesis wants us to understand whether we accept it or not, God is the maker. He is the one who gives and one of the good gifts he gives is sexual differentiation. That's the second idea. Second differ sexual differentiation is a gift. Notice that Adam, the male, is alone. It's the only thing in God's good world that is not good, that's, that's not flourishing, that's not whole, that's not the way it's supposed to be. And in order to help Adam feel that aloneness and to look forward to God's provision, God causes all the animals to pass by. And verse 20 tells us that, um, but for Adam, but for the man, there was not found a helper fit for him. Fit for him. What does that mean? Well, the Hebrew there actually literally is corresponds to him. Uh, there's not a helper that corresponds to him. Cor corresponds to him how? Well, as a human being, certainly. A, a body and soul being unlike every other animal that he's named. A, a, a body-soul being that would ensure that he would not be alone. 
But if companionship was the only thing that Adam really needed, the other animals could have provided that. There are many of us who make our way through life basically alone, but we have a dog, or we have a cat, or we, we have another animal who provides companionship. Why was it important that there would be a body-soul person who was differentiated from himself, that, that corresponded to him? Well, because, because he was looking for a, a, a person, a being, that corresponded to him in a sexually differentiated way. To put it plainly, Adam was looking for a female that corresponded to him as a male. And, and when God makes the woman from Adam and brings her to him, his response is almost lyrical in his wonder and joy and praise. This, at last, is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called Ishi, that's the Hebrew, woman because she was taken out of ish, man. You see in the, the word play in the Hebrew, ishi to ish, woman to man, there's this tight correspondence uh, between the man and the woman and the woman and the man. But above all, what does this man recognize? He, he sees the woman as gift, as gift because she corresponds to him. The woman is, is another body-soul being, yes. She, she's, she's human, but she's more than human. This isn't another male that's brought to him, right? I mean, that, that would be companionship if, if Adam had another Adam to enjoy companionship with. That, but that's not why he's lyrical with wonder and praise. No, he's lyrical with wonder and praise because this is... This is another person, a body-soul being that corresponds to him sexually. She is taken out of the man, but for the purpose of, of reuniting to the man. The man shall leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife. That Hebrew word cleave has the idea of, of being soldered together. This rib that's taken out, that's made into woman, that's sexually differentiated from him, he shall solder himself back together with her once again. That's the part of the idea behind they shall become one flesh. And while we recognize that one flesh means more than one body, it's not less than that. And so as, as Abigail Favell observes, sexual differentiation is no mistake. It's not a bug in the system. It's actually an essential feature of the world that God has made, as well as a cause of joy and wonder. Sexual difference is good. Our bodies are good. God's original created order is a good gift. But, and here's the last idea, sexual differentiation into male and female is not merely gift. Sexual differentiation has purpose. And according to Genesis there are at least three purposes in sexual differentiation as male and female. And the first is this. Together, male and female image God. Together, male and female image God. Now, I've mentioned this already, but it needs to be repeated. It's not simply males who image God. Not simply male bodies. Not simply male souls. Those were ideas current, not just in the ancient Near East, but also in Greek philosophy, that it was really the males who imaged the gods. No, that's not how the Bible speaks of it. Rather, male and female together show God's likeness. And that's because within God's own self, God is a communion of persons. He is an ever-circling relationship of love and delight. God is not a monad, a single entity. God is trinity. He is difference in unity. C.S. Lewis observed in Mere Christianity that when John says in 1 John 4 twice, God is love, he was actually making a Trinitarian claim. Because if God is love, then God must love himself in a differentiated way. There has to be difference within the unity of God if God is love. 
And so within God's own self, there is this communion of persons, Father, Son, Spirit. How does, how does difference in unity then get imaged forth? It gets imaged forth, as we read in Genesis 1, male and female, he created them. And so at a basic human level, male and female differentiation and union serves to image forth the difference in unity, the, the communion of persons, the love that is God's own self. According to Genesis, that's one purpose for sexual differentiation. But, but there's a second one. Uh, together, male and female procreate. One of the issues at stake in the, in the present L LGBTQ debates is what are sexual relations for? With the rise of, of effective hormonal contraception in the 1960s, the purpose of sexual relations has, has shifted from procreation to recreation, away from initiating a new life towards fundamentally about intimacy and pleasure. Now, Certainly there's intimacy and pleasure in the marital relation, but, but fundamental to why God made us male and female is that we might procreate. As he, as he charged Adam and Eve in Genesis 1, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. That's what our bodies are made for. Even at the chromosomal level, our bodies are, are made to, to come together to produce new life. Every cell in the body has 23 pairs of chromosomes, except for one. Sperm only have 23 chromosomes. Ovum only have 23 chromosomes. It's when they come together and new life begins that the cells begin replicating again. Uh, 23 pairs, 46 chromosomes. I mean, even at a cellular level, male and female together is what's necessary to produce new life. And so we were made, male and female, to potentially produce new children. It's another purpose for why we are sexually differentiated humans. But finally tonight, the, the, the third purpose, I think, for sexual differentiation is that together, male and female, we enjoy God. Both the man and the woman were in the garden. Both are addressed by God. Both presumably enjoyed God's presence there as he walked in the garden in the cool of the day. Both were invited to eat from any tree in the garden save one. Both heard God's word and knew it. Both were his image bearers. Both were naked and unashamed. Both male and female bodies reflected exactly who they were to God and to each other. And all of that tells me that God's purpose in making both male and female is that together we might glorify and enjoy God. In other words, each human's chief end, but also males and females together, our chief end, is to glorify and to enjoy God. And that would not be the same if we were all men. And that would not be the same if we were all women. Sex identities are part of God's overarching purpose for his world. Now, there's more that can be said and will be said in a couple of weeks when we take up a second go at this, this theme of to be human is to be either male or female. But I want to come back to that, that question that I asked at the very beginning, which I think is right at the center of so much confusion uh, in our world today. Is our God-given sex identity essential to who we are? Or is our sex identity and gender something that we construct Friends, the answer that Genesis gives is unequivocal. To be human is to be either male or female. It's essential to who we are. It's given to us by the God who made us. And when we name ourselves as men and women, we, we, we name reality as it already exists, not, not some social, cultural fiction that we're imposing upon reality. And ultimately, all of this is part of God's larger purpose for his world, that we would know his joy, that we would know his love, we would know his glory, and we would know his goodness. As Calvin repeatedly reminds us in his institutes, our very creation and the world that God made at the beginning was, was perfectly constructed by a father who desperately loves his children. As we continue to remember this is what it means to be human. 
we, we begin to understand the heart of our Father for us, and we begin to see him more clearly. Would you pray with me, please? Almighty God, these are difficult things to talk about, um, hard sometimes to even get our heads around exactly the nature of the conversation. But Lord, we do believe that these are important things. And so Lord, we do ask that you would continue to guide and direct the thoughts and intents of our hearts. Lord, we are mindful that your word tells us to not be conformed to the world around us, but to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. Lord, the only way our minds can be renewed is as as you wash our minds with the water of your word, as your spirit takes your word and applies it to our minds and our hearts so that we might think clearly as well as live rightly. And so, Lord, we ask that you would help us to see clearly, that you would be our vision, that you, high king of heaven, would be our highest heart's desire, and we would delight in you and in your word. Grant us this, Lord, we ask. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.